good boy. Hello, I'm Don Nickel, and in this program, we plan to bring you an introduction to quail hunting in Australia. Throughout the program, I'll be joined by my mate, Elio Colosimone from Queensland, and his two dogs, Sophie, a seven and a half year old bitch, and Fergus, her son, a two and a half year old dog. We are in fact at the moment in the Darling Downs of Southern Queensland, but just as easily it could be anywhere in Australia, probably within two hours from a capital city. The dogs you'll be seeing are German short hair pointers, they are versatile dogs which hunt, point and retrieve. I in fact used to live in Queensland and Elio and I have hunted for many years and part of this trip is to try and recapture the hunting we used to have. It's our contention that good dog work is an integral part of good quail hunting and we hope and certainly will give you some tremendous dog work to watch. Well Elio, we might move off and see if we can get some action. Right, I think the dogs are keen and they're all set to go. Okay. Come on. You could walk for hours in this country and never see a quail unless you accidentally stumbled across a bird or if you had a gun dog. The pointing breeds of gun dog have been bred for generations to range out and scent the wind and to locate the quail. Sometimes they will find an old scent, but the experienced dog will soon move on. There are two species of quail you can legally hunt in many parts of Australia. That's the stubble and the brown quail. In this particular paddock, we would expect to find stubble quail. When the dog locates a bird, it will freeze on point, allowing the hunter to move up and take the shot. Pitch. Some people seeing the dogs coming in, rolling the birds in their mouth, think might think they were chewing them to pieces. But in fact, if you if you feel this quail here, the rib cage is totally still intact, which is the best sign of soft mouth. There's no damage to the bird, and uh, it's really fit for eating at the table. Now, these birds are very very clean, all of them. Uh, there's not even the slightest hint of even a, a slight tear or anything on the skin, you know, and, and uh, uh, that business of rolling of the mouth, I'm not quite sure. Uh, maybe it's the feathers in the mouth that cause some dogs to roll them. I've never been able to work out why some dogs do and some dogs don't. Sophie does it sometimes. Uh, Fergus, the young dog, does it less often. Occasionally, very, very occasionally. Uh, but the important point is that they're handling their birds cleanly. But this is certainly uh, stubble quail country, isn't it? Well, they like this because the taller grass gives them protection from the predators like the hawks and the magpies. And they've got uh, plenty of weed seeds here. It'll be interesting tonight when we get back and we open up the crops just to have a look at the, the seed and, and whatever they've been eating. It's amazing the range of things that the quail eat. Stubble quail have often got large caterpillars inside them and or seeds and or sometimes nothing so you know it's 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 always uh, learning to get to know the bird when you and its habitat and it's uh, it's just way of living when you open that uh, that's right that crop up if you're a bit of a keen fisherman you tend to if, if you're really interested in in the sport you tend to open them up and see what they've been eating it gives you a bit of an idea of the sort of bait you should be using and i think with quail a similar sort of thing yeah. You look at what they've been eating and it gives you a bit of an idea of which paddocks you ought to be going into or yeah. where the birds might be coming from. Uh, if there's feed nearby, they don't necessarily have to eat here. But they may congregate here for protection, but they may go and eat over there. But if there's no feed, there's going to be no quail, that's for sure. I see you use uh, two different types of whistle. Uh, one to stop the dog and one to turn it when it's out there. They look pretty interesting whistles. What's the background on them? Well, these two here, are s these two power ones, the long ones, are uh, staghorn whistles. 
This one originates in the United Kingdom and uh, this is a homemade version of the same sort of thing. My brother made several of these. He just got hold of some uh, stag horn tips, drilled them out and glued in a piece of wood to give uh, the whistle. And this is a simple Acme Thunderer, referee's whistle. And I use that as my stop whistle. Uh, I started using this one when the dogs were all very young and tried to associate the, uh, the sitting with, with this particular whistle. And uh, I find, I, I have seen people actually in the paddock whistling, you know, using their <laughs> mouth, and uh, it doesn't work for me. Uh, you know, you, you're walking around, your mouth is, is fairly dry. On top of that some days, you know, you, you whistle, it doesn't just work. So I rely on these and of course, you know, they're much more effective. Yeah, it's uh, very good to use a turning whistle when you're training the dog early on in the piece when you want the dog to turn, to just give it a toot, a, a little whistle as it turns on the wind and very soon your dog gets that quartering pat pattern which is so necessary for a, a pointing dog to, to use the wind and pick up the birds. Stay. Fitch. It takes a long time and lots of patience to train a dog to these standards. Most well-bred gun dogs have natural instincts and working ability, but unless you put in the basic groundwork in training, your dog won't reach the necessary level to be steady and under control in the field. Your dog might be obedient around the house or down at the local park, but out here, with all this excitement and activity, he could run wild. When you're running two dogs, when one dog comes on point, its brace mate should naturally honour the first dog's point by backing. By backing, it actually points at the dog on point. If it didn't back, it would run in and spoil the first dog's work, and the game could be lost. Retrieving is a most important part of the dog work. The dog will usually mark the area of the fall of the bird, but in case they don't, the dog should be trained to take commands from the hunter to guide them to the area of the fall and to pick up the short bird. That applies to retrieves on land and from water. Sit. Sit. Uh, a couple of interesting things happened then. <laughs> yeah, well, I, when that first bird came out, they said fine, but then the other one, and then another one after that. Uh, tremendous distraction for the dog. Uh, this is where that business of control comes in again. A tremendous control, a lot of things happening at once. Yeah. The dog pushed out the first bird, it was shot, it had to stay under your control. Then it went out, and while it was going out, the second bird came up and was shot, and that was another distraction. And then, last of all, um, when it went out to pick the last bird up, another bird took off. And um, I've seen many a dog start to chase a bird like that and keep going. Um, well, that's the thing about an unsteady dog. An unsteady dog would have just uh, messed that whole situation up. and. Uh, probably blocked one of the second shots and just wouldn't have allowed you to get it away. That's right. It's interesting to note too, I suppose, people who, who uh, haven't used a dog themselves, that these dogs are used to working with me. Mm. It's a bit hard for them to, to turn and take complete Command. notice of you. Yeah. And inevitably when they pick up their bird, they automatically want to come back to me. Mm. Well, I think we'd better clean these. Uh, we didn't fill the bag limit. The bag limit is 12 apiece, but uh, it was a nice morning's hunting, and uh, we'll just have to prepare them for the table now.
That's a, it's a male bird, a cock bird you've got, isn't it? That's right. The, um, the male has a reddish-orange tinge around the head, coming down the shoulders, and has a darker fleck through it. Actually, they're quite distinctive to the female. I think you've got a female there, haven't you? Yeah, the female's a much plainer coloured bird and uh, doesn't have that uh, distinct colouring pattern of the cockbird. You know, you hear different stories from different people ex of exactly where they have found these stubble quail. Do you get any ideas yourself? Or have you heard of any research that gives you an idea of density of these birds and distribution at all? Well, yes, I think that uh, there has been research done but uh, by CSIRO and by various national parks and wildlife. But the thing about quail is that they're spread so widely across Australia that there's a limit to how much research is really known about their movement and uh, their habitat and what really makes them uh, such a prolific bird in some seasons and how in other seasons they tend to fall away in numbers. Pasture development on properties around Australia has increased their habitat. They still hang into the natural grasslands, but basically they're widely spread from Western Australia to Northern Queensland. I've shot them in all those areas, Victoria, the Snowy Mountains, the Hunter Valley, and up here in Queensland now, throughout the Darling Downs and even on the Atherton Tablelands. Uh, there's a truism about quail. Quail are where you find them. They, they certainly have got a big range of habitats and they move around a lot. Uh, I've had a few people ask me this question. People say, uh, what about the hunting pressure? Is it too much on the quail? And uh, my reaction has been, and from any information that I've ever been able to gather from anyone is the fact that there is a tremendously high natural attrition rate with these birds and hunting pressure virtually has no effect on them whatsoever. Yeah, I think that there are, there are some game species where we've got to be aware of uh, possible hunting pressure but I think in the case of quail they're such a prolific uh, bird. When, they, when they've got a season, when they've got good rain throughout the season they're, they're laying many eggs and they're having more than one clutch of egg and they're breeding up in big numbers and then, as you say, they die off in large numbers when they hit a, a dry period and, uh, you know, the hunting pressure on quail, because it's a more specialised type of uh, hunting, the need for the dog, the need to travel uh, into new areas, always to, to keep up with where the quail are, means that I'd say that there's a negligible hunting pressure on quail in Australia. I came to Australia 14 years ago and I've just uh, really carried on uh, what I did in South America when I lived there and in Scotland where I was born, is that you've got natural, uh, they're fairly prolific game species, they build up in the good seasons and they die off a fairly cruel death in, in, in the bad seasons and that if we can harvest them, if we can make use of them, it's just another uh, utilisation of the, the land resource that we have. And uh, that's the way I've always looked at it. I, I feel no bloodlust at shooting a quail. To me, I get pride in having a good dog, being an efficient shot, using uh, efficiency in getting the bird, and to be at, in surroundings like this, uh, to be quite honest, I just can't think of anything better. I just like being out in the bush and, you know, the bush in Australia to me is, is the beauty of the country and if you can enjoy it in this type of situation and uh, then take some game home uh, and eat it with your family and, uh, you know, all my kids love eating game, they, they always have. I, I just see it's just, uh, it's just a, a perfect way of, uh, of, of building on, you know, the kind of Australian lifestyle we have. It goes without saying, I think it needs to be said that the hunter has a, a, a big responsibility. He needs to know his game, he needs to know the laws that govern the use of guns and, uh, and anything else that goes with hunting. He needs to be able to identify species quite quickly and that's a responsibility that really rests on their shoulders. Each, each man that goes out 
or each person that goes out to hunt should, should have those things in the back of their mind at all times. What is that thing, Don? That's a trigger guard, and it just safeguards your trigger so that uh, when mm. that you, no one can pull the trigger, so therefore it's safe from kids. I like it, especially when I'm travelling, because when the gu gun's out of the cabinet, it's difficult to keep it safe at all times. And with the trigger guard there, you just uh, you've, got, you've got to unlock it to to get it off. So it's uh, it just just safeguards it and actually it's a great idea isn't it yeah and yeah. so there you go you you're ready to go hmm and it's no i notice uh, you've still got your light little gun uh, yeah have you found it these last few years oh well <coughs> i think uh, for quail hunting and uh, i do a lot of rabbit hunting with it over the dogs um i think it's an excellent gun it's light it's under six pounds in weight it's a nice snappy short barrel, about 25 and a half inches. And what I especially like about it is the English type stock, which I feel gets up to your shoulder very quickly. When you know when a, a, a quail flushes, then I just think it points well. So it was specifically made by Winchester for the upland game shooter and the fellow who shoots over dogs and. Uh, I've found it an excellent gun. Mm, yeah. What about yourself? Have well, you still got that wind choke? Yes, I've had this one for a few years now. It's, um, well, it's called the Winchester Model 101 XTR Lightweight, and it's in multi choke. In other words, you uh, have screw in chokes up the top here. You know, um, you adapt it to suit whatever shooting you're going to do. I've tended to use um, improved cylinder and modified, which is quarter and half. Uh, but I'm starting to be swayed to going into even more open chokes for this sort of shooting. The more open seems to be the better. And um, I've been very, very happy with this. Um, it's thrown the sort of patterns I've wanted. And of course, you've got the advantage that if you change over to a bit of duck shooting, you may want something a little tighter. And um, the cartridges, they seem to be so important. In fact, I've started uh, loading my own at home and of late I've, I've been using, or for the last couple of years, I've been using one ounce loads. Uh, it's very, very important to follow the manufacturer's guidelines for these, but I've had to use a spacer. Uh, because um, I haven't been able to find wads that actually hold the one ounce shot and it's important you get a very nice crimp on it. Uh, but these have been excellent. Number eight shot, one ounce loads, they seem to give a nice clean kill. And uh, what are you using today? Oh well, um, now that I'm not shooting as many quail as I used to, I'm not reloading for quail and so I just buy the factory load. This is uh, an ounce and a sixteenth with the number 10 shot and uh, I think it's excellent. I agree with you about the ounce load. Uh, reloading I would always go to an ounce but uh, in factory loads this is probably the best for, for the quail. I brought my nine month old Springer Spaniel pup along for the experience. He hasn't come across quail before and now that his basic training is completed, I'd like to give him a little bit of the real thing. This paddock with its heavy cover of sorghum stubble is just what flushing breeds like spaniels are bred for. They don't point like the German short hair pointers, they flush the game for the gun. Good boy. 
Come on. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Up. Often you'll be out hunting quail and you come across a stretch of water with ducks in it. That's where the Vestal gun dogs like short hairs and the springers really come to the fore. They work in the paddock on the quail and can retrieve from water on the ducks. Well, I've been very happy with the way my pup has remained steady with all those ducks flying by and those shots going off. Now I'll give him his first ever duck retrieve. Fitch it, go. He's the product of many generations of careful breeding for working ability, but it's great to see it all coming to fruition at such an early age. Good boy. 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 You need your dogs under control, especially when you're coming up to a dam. A dog that races about would disturb all the game and you wouldn't get a shot off. Your dog is really a great mate when you're out hunting. Waiting for the ducks to come is much easier when you have your dog at your side. Hold. Hold. Good dog. Sit. Hold. Good dog. Hold. Good dog. Leave. Good dog. The shooting was over for the day and it was time to relax. It was also time to prepare for the next day's hunting in another district with some other friends to look for the brown quail. You find brown quail in the more coastal wetter areas around Australia. They inhabit swamps and creek edges in the heavier, denser cover. Instead of in ones or twos like the stubble quail, the browns are often found in coveys of up to 20 birds.
We're now much closer to the coast, and we've caught up with two old friends, Warren Mackay and Bob Bishop, and their Hungarian vigilers. These are other versatile breeds of gun dog. They hunt, point, and retrieve like the short hairs. We took the opportunity to ask Warren about the brown quail in this district. What are the brown quail like in this area this year? Hasn't been as many as in the past, Don. Um, yeah. The water's come up quite dramatically to what it has been in the past years, and the dam's starting to fill. But round the edges, particularly down the end of this point here, is an extremely good brown quail area. Yeah. And over the years, we've had a good steady harvest of browns out of there. Mm. What it's like now, I'm not quite sure. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we got onto a covey of browns just across the other side of the water. Um, what I'm hoping now, of course, the browns being very territorial, they should have just, I don't think they would have shifted from the area, I think this would have moved back as the water's risen. And uh, so I'm just hoping we can work the dogs round the water's edge, round here, down to the point, back up along the river, hoping we can pick up a covey or two. Yep. When do the the brown quail season up here, when does it run from? Well, as a generalisation, Don, it runs from the, usually the weekend closest to the beginning of June. And this year it's running from the last weekend in May through the last weekend in August. August, in yeah. Day. So that'd be That's the it. latest quail season anywhere in Australia, probably. It is, yes. Much yeah. later than New South Wales. On the, uh, get your licence, of course, with the national parks. I see you've got your quail licence in Doss for deer as well. Yes, we've got an open season on deer here in Queensland this year. And uh, you buy the necessary tags, of course, and with the necessary property owner approval, yeah. you can legally hunt deer. And that's what that one's endorsed for, of course. I've got all the ducks, stubble quail, brown quail, red deer, and also fallow deer. Mm. All on the one permit. Well, that's good. Anyway, Don, I reckon we'll pick up some browns around the edges here. We'll work around the water. And with the various inlets and that, there's a good chance of a duck, so I'd grab a couple of duck load as well. Okay, we'll get some. Good leave. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Heel. Good girl. Stick it, bud. Toby, come. Come on. Good boy. Come on, Toby. Toby. Good, good boy. The short hair and the vigila are both utility dogs. The vigila originated in Hungary, but is not as well known in Australia as the short hair. Both these pointing breeds range out further than the Springer Spaniel in their hunting pattern. Graham, get on. The springer tends to work within 15 to 20 metres, whereas the pointers will range out to 120 metres. Because it doesn't come on point, the springer always has to be within shotgun range for the shooter to get the shot. Get Good boy. Come on, Dad. Come on, Dad. 
Have you come? Had a boy. Come on. Most Have birds are killed cleanly, but yeah, occasionally a bird is wounded. By using a well-trained gun dog, the bird is quickly located and retrieved. Out of the water earlier. Yeah, well, that's the second this morning. Well, you've done a lot of shooting on browns. That's pretty typical of what happens working browns around the edges of dams and creeks and so on. Oh, heck yeah. They yeah. take off and straight across the water they want to go, and bang, if you shoot them, well, they're in the middle of the water. Your dog's got to pick them up. It's a bit different to your stubble. That's exactly right. A lot different to your stubble. Then. That's right. Uh, I can't think, oh, it might have happened once or twice in my life where I've had to pick a stubble out of water. <laughs> But it happens uh, off and on with, with the browns, especially around dams. Well, we're These... out, we were out here about oh, three weeks ago, and uh, I would have said three out of every four retrieves we had were out of water. Because right. they did exactly that, took off straight across yeah. the water. Well, it highlights uh, the worth, really, of these utility-style gun dogs. Uh, they have to handle the pointing work, and then bang, they turn around and try and do quite a reasonable retrieve in, in water, across water, and so on. Well, what more could you ask for? You get a duck, you get a quail, a hare comes up, you've got the lot. That's right, I think we've just about covered it all this morning. What do you reckon we go across that same ground again? I think there's, I'd there's work a chance it again. there's something in there. Come on, dogs. Come on, Dad. Well, I came all this way and uh, didn't get one shot at a brown quail, but you fellas seem to have done all right. Oh, got a couple each. They're a different bird to the stubble completely, aren't they? They certainly are. It's quite a yellow leg on them, of course. Yeah. Very marked difference. That's a cock bird you've got, is it? Yeah. Yes. He's got the brighter plumage uh, with that black banded Fleck through there, and the female you've got there, she's uh, a little bit duller, but uh, beautiful bird. Certainly mm. much harder to tell the difference between the cock and the hen than it is with your stubbles. Oh yes, yeah. I still have trouble actually until I got a pair of them together. The brown can vary considerably depending on, on uh, their localities. Some of the browns we've come across have nearly been the same colour as stubble. Yeah. yeah. And some of them are richly orange. Yes. Uh, so you can get a quite a range in brown. Yeah, throughout, throughout different parts of the coastal country and blady grass country and on uh, coastal tropical grass country, you tend to get, uh, as you say, a variation in colour. I think the other difference too, in eating wise, which is why we shoot them in the first place, is your browns have got quite a white meat to them. Yeah. Whereas your, your stubble have got the, the reddish meat, and uh, I actually love eating browns, the beautiful white meat, they yeah. Yeah, cook I think, up beautifully. I think I prefer the, the browns, the flesh is, is, is very nice, very pale, very chicken-like. 
Well, we, we certainly didn't uh, fill the bag today but on, on these brands, but it just gives you a taste of what it's all about. I think that uh, one of the major things is that the brand in the covey, the way it explodes is just a totally different test for the dog. The dog's got to locate them, whether in blady grass or in clump grass, and then it's the skill of the shooter to pick out the one to shoot, and then the skill of the dog to see which one it was that was down and go and get him. You can prepare quail and duck for the table in many ways. Cooked well and properly presented, it provides nutritious, tasty food that the whole family can enjoy. What else can I have? Well, we might well done. Uh, I had a funny experience. I'm not sure whether I would call it really funny. With uh, I had a Springer once. Did you know about that? Yes, I remember when I first met you. You had a. You told me about a Springer you had. And uh, I did what most people do. I decided I wanted a hunting dog. I looked up one of the uh, capital city papers and looked at the advertisements and found a Springer and rang up and asked the, the breeder to send it to me. But unfortunately things didn't work out quite the way I wanted them to. Uh, the pup, I tried, I tried my best, but it didn't seem to have that work instinct in it. And uh, I'm sure they should have been a better way of getting a pup than I did the first time. Now that pup of yours has got an interesting background, hasn't it? Yes, well, I've uh, seen its its mother and a few other, a few of its uncles and uh, aunties running in the field working. And so when I wanted to get a Springer for my rabbit hunting uh, in the New England, I immediately thought of this bloodline. and. Uh, then the actual sire of this pup is an imported dog and to satisfy myself it was the type of dog I wanted as a sire um, I went to see him at the breeder's place and he had the temperament and he's got the background he's got uh, quite a few field trial champions in his background so that was not a guarantee that this pup was going to work out well, but it was certainly stacking the odds in my favour that I was getting a pup that was going to work and be uh, a dog that would uh, work on for quite a few years. I think it's very important, uh, that business of giving yourself a, a reasonable chance of getting a good dog. Initially, I like to have a bit of a look at the, the mum and dad and s hopefully have a look at the sire and the dam working in the field, just to get a bit of an idea of what the pup is likely to do. Yeah, certainly that's the best uh, situation when you can see both the sire and the dam off the pups working in the field, then it gives you, uh, gives you a tremendous insight into the potential uh, way your pup will work in future. Well, that's right. Um, you can look at the pedigree and you can see things such as field trial champion in the pedigree. Well, at least you know then that um, that particular dog in the pedigree has reached a certain standard of excellence in the field over a period of time. Yes. But uh, uh, a dog uh, does not have to have field trial champions as its parents to do quite well. Um, I guess we're back to going and having a look for yourself. Yeah. And, uh, most importantly, it's this business here. You've got a Springer and I've got GSPs. Uh, I think there's a reason behind that. Um, you've said it yourself many a time. You really need to know what you want your dog for. Yes, again, that horses for courses argument. Once you've decided what's the best uh, hunting available to you, then you've got to decide which breed. And once you've decided which breed, you've then got to look do some research into the breed to see where are the where are the kennels, where are the bloodlines that are going to give you a pup with a high potential to get to the standard that's necessary for good quail hunting, duck hunting, or rabbit hunting, or whatever hunting you you look for.
Well, as, um, as we both know, quite often it's not that easy to go off and have a look at mum and dad work and, and quite often you're relying on the judgment of people whose judgment you can actually re trust and uh, they've actually seen the parents at work and they can give you a reasonably good rundown of how they do work. Yeah, well, I suppose that Sophie is a case in point. Well, that's right, yes. Um, you've seen her from when she was a little tiny pup and um, you were the one that suggested I'd buy the pup. If I remember right, you'd made your judgments on what you had seen uh, the mother do in particular. Yes, well, I'd seen, I'd seen the mother and I'd also seen uh, some uh, an aunties of uh, your pup and the, again, in the case of the sire, I took the judgment of two people who I know and respect and they told me the sire of Sophie was a good working dog with no vices and good temperament. So in, in the case of Sophie, as we've seen throughout the program, the whole thing's come together. That's right. Well, I think it's gone a full circle now. Um, I've had Sophie for a long time and I've been particularly happy with her work. In fact, she's given me a tremendous amount of pleasure watching her work in the field and I decided, well, you know, I'd like a puppy from her and uh, I decided to use a field trial champion from Victoria, Starlac Castus. And, uh, and this is the result, little Ruby, Sophie's daughter. And I expect that uh, a lot of those traits that the mother has and the father has should start coming out in her. Ruby, come on. Well, it goes without saying, too, um, these are family pets also. They are hunting dogs, but family pets. Um, I really do want these dogs to be kind and easy around children, and they are. And um, in every respect, they become part of the family. Uh, just because they hunt so much doesn't necessarily mean that that's all they do. Yeah. They do really become lovely family pets. In this program, we've shown you the German shorty appointed at work, a little bit of the Hungarian Vigila, and the beginnings of a young English Springer Spaniel. In future programs in this series, we'll show you other breeds of gun dog working on other game species in Australia.